I am in the season of my life where I don't want him to have to pry things from my hands for me to realize that I was holding them too tightly. I want to consistently bring them to him and ask, am I even supposed to still be holding this? And if he says no, to trust him because he was my hope, not the thing I had in my hand. Welcome to Hope Talks, where we want to give you every reason for hope for every challenge in life. Uh, I'm Haley Scully. I'm one of your hosts, along with Dustin Anderson. And today we have special guest, Crystal Evans Hurst. And many of you are going to know Crystal already. I've got a whole long list of author and podcaster and mother of five, mentor, coach, encourager. She is a conference speaker. That's one of the ways that we have connected with you uh, recently. You're going to be speaking at our Hope Together conference this fall and this September. And We feel like we already know you, even though this is a first time for us, um, and we appreciate the time you're going to give us. So, Dustin, how do we launch into getting Crystal's hope story? Yeah, um, well, first, again, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it and taking the time to be with us today. I've heard from June Hunt, our founder, and Greg Steer from Dare to Share, and their hope story was interesting. They both grew up in a background with a very this rough childhood, kind of abusive home, but they still found hope in Christ and led, you know, incredible ministries. Um, But for you, growing up in a strong Christian home, I imagine that hope story is a bit different. So, but we know, you know, none of us are immune from the trials of life. And today at our staff time, we're talking about just being blindsided by different trials and sufferings that come our way. So I did want to ask just up front, just when did hope become real to you? And was there a time when you kind of really leaned into Christ and learned that he's not only your hope for salvation, but just for everyday life and struggles? Well, first of all, thank you so much, Justin and Haley, for having me on. It's my pleasure to be with you today and to share in the spreading of hope because we all need it most of the time when uh, we least expect that we'll need it. And then we need it multiple times throughout our lives, right? So mm-hmm. I'm glad to be a part of what you're doing here. Um, I think with that said, you know, there's so many times when I needed hope to rise up, to spring up, you know, with discouragement or with the shift in season in my life. But I would say the first time I really felt that hope springing up was in my late 20s after um, being a single parent for the majority of that time, trying to figure out after college, where to start a career, trying different jobs, hating one, disliking the other. I remember stumbling into, you know, this is back when jobs were in the paper and I stumbled onto an ad for a job and I thought, I think I can do that. And I applied for the job and I got the job and just feeling that God really did have a plan. And in that job, what was so unique about it was because all these random things that I had done before, they they needed. And in that one fell swoop, it was almost like that scripture, Romans 8, 28, came to life for me. You have been figuring it out, feeling like you're in the dark, going in circles, wondering why you only spent six months here or two years here, or that class that you were like, why do I have to take this as a part of my degree? Or And he used all those things in that moment. Now, it wasn't just about the job. It was about my life feeling like it had just been spinning out of control. And in that role, I had the opportunity to have other things stabilized. So my career was one of those things. Finances were another. But I also connected with, during that season, I was connected with a... um a choir at my church. I was leading a choir. And that choir became a group of women and men who close became some of my fastest friends still to this day. Uh, It was a young adults choir. None of us are young adults anymore, but we kept those friendships going. So at the same time, God put puzzle pieces together for my career. He put puzzles together for my relational community. Um, He put puzzles together for me in seeing how some things in terms of my wiring he had put there by showing me how to use it. And then the last thing is I just saw the culmination of who I knew him to be in various seasons, but who I had not claimed him to be or held on to him to be for me in the season that I'm in. That's kind of what uh, was the cherry on top. It was, so now I'm in the right job. So now I have the right question, no quote friends. 
And so now I'm right in a way that I have not been before with God, just clearer about where I'm supposed to be with him and what I'm supposed to do. The the thing is, I was so relieved because I had come from so, so many questions about what wasn't right and what was never going to change. And in a matter of a few weeks, just applying to that one job, not only did my vision change because of his provision, it changed because it caused me to look back and see how he'd been providing all along. So the that's the first time I remember kind of beyond traumatic, deep and difficult experiences, but just kind of an everyday living of life and watching him pull pieces together for me. I love that. That kind of my story is a lot like that too. Like grew up in church and then in my 20s, just trying to do all my own junk and then wondering why God wasn't making things <laughs> click, you know, right, 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 <laughs> like right. why isn't this happening? And and I always say it like he didn't let me get comfortable in the things that were preventing me to from stepping into my calling with him. Right. Like there was a calling and there's such a protection. Look around. And if it's not going right and well, have you really leaned into where God may have you, where God mm-hmm. wants you to be? You know, mm-hmm. and I always said, like, I wanted God to fix things. I felt like he took me back into the backwoods. <laughs> like I started everything over when I was like 31 years old. But leaning into him, I want life to work. I want things to make sense. I want my skills to work. But in order to do that, it is thinking about why was I created and who created yeah. me and connecting yeah. that to that's my hope. That's my hope to have a life that is fulfilling. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's the thing. I think you you go to church, you you study the word, you learn these principles, and then you're looking to see those principles at work in your life. Mm-hmm. You know, this is why we ask, well, if you did it for them, will you do it for me? Like, will you answer my prayers like that? I can hear preacher preach and okay, that's great that they got that out of the word, but would you reveal that to me? If I pray, will you answer my prayer requests like that? Like there's this kind of I believe it. I've heard it. I've been in it. I've been around it. Does it work for me? Does this match my experience? And, you know, Romans 5, 5 talks about uh, hope, uh, not disappointing. And and you don't hope in hope itself. You hope in the one who brings that hope to you. But um, I think that's what the lessons are all about. Ultimately, it's what did you hope for? What was your expectation? And most of us are disappointed because something in our life did not meet our expectation. But was your expectation in the right place? You know, right. was it dependent on this person or this circumstance or was it embedded in your trust of Jesus Christ and what he can do in your life? And so that was the time where I connected what I hoped for in the physical and what I wanted to experience in the flesh um, in my in here on earth experience, connecting that with, wow, I didn't just get a job because I applied for an ad. I got a job because all the things that I'd been doing in my 20s that felt disconnected and not purposeful. He knew what he was doing all along. So me resting in that season was me saying, wow, I can trust God. I can have my expectation in him because he uh, will not disappoint. And some things we get to see in life and some things we don't. Some things he doesn't disappoint on in the timeline after we're not here. But what I do believe is that if you keep your eyes open long enough and if you are committed to him, he has a way of stitching things together for you. And then you realize what you wanted wasn't really what you wanted. What you wanted and what you want now is him because you trust him to continually stitch things together for you as needed from after that. That's right. I mean, I would throw down over everything you just said. That was (laughs) awesome. Why do you think even for those of us that grow up, you know, believing or being exposed to the truth, why do you think it takes some of us so long to make that connection? I think because the way we are wired and the way God built the world is he wants us to choose. So he gives us exposure and he gives us options and then he gives us information and a choice, but we have to choose it. And it's not real until we choose. I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And he said, you know, eat of any of these trees, just don't eat of that one. I I can set you up with all the things, but unless you are choosing me, this intimacy, this connection, this relationship isn't real. Like you have to love him back. (laughs) And so 
I think we live lives where he gives us the choice of loving him back. And it's not until we decide to see that he loves us, to trust that his love is real. And because we trust that his love is real, we love him back. We don't get the full experience of it, but it wouldn't be a true experience if he made us. Jesus was on earth and he just, you know, was walking around healing people, talking in parables and, you know, and like, y'all, the son of man, the son of God is here and y'all aren't getting this. But he completely availed himself to those who wanted to go deeper. He did not hold back. He just said, I'm going to give you options, but it's not until you choose me. I'm going to invite you, but you have to choose me to really get the full experience. And sometimes we have to wait on life to force us to choose him without you having to. Guess what we like to do? Do things ourselves. We like to be our own. We like to be our own hopes. I'm the boss of me. I'm, I'm the boss, the boss of me. Of me. <laughs> <laughs> I went, you know, even as you're saying that, I never really thought about this in particular, but throughout scripture, some of the people that God worked with the most were those that wrestled with him. You know, yeah. Jacob and David. And David's like, why aren't you? And we've talked about that. David, he always circles it back. And, but you, oh God, you know, he, he comes back to what he believes, regardless of the wrestling or the, the struggle. It, for me, it feels like, what a precious thing that he would see something in us that would give us an opportunity to wrestle with him in that way. You know, if you don't care, if you don't mind, you just, okay, we'll go on about your business. To feel chosen in a way to go through the wrestle, to understand the hope and be set free, I think is something to cherish, you know, something to yeah. really be grateful for. Yeah. I think two of the, yeah, the situation you had said something about, you know, the sometimes life forces us to have to make that choice. And I think of the situations in my life where, you know, I've, I lost my parents really young. I lost my mom when I was 16 and my dad when I was uh, about 26. And it was kind of those situations and a few other family situations where it's just like, where else am I going to go? You're my only hope right now. And I think of that, I've been wrestling with this passage in John, I think John 6, you know, where Jesus is giving a bunch of hard teachings and, a, you know, a bunch of followers walk away and Jesus said, are you going to leave too? And Peter said, "Where, you know, where else are we going to go? Yeah. Like where, and that, to me, that's just been a question and, and one of hope of just like, where else are you going to turn for hope? I mean, right. Y- you alone have the words of eternal life, he said. And so I think that's a good encouragement there. Back to your story, what you had said at that time, you kind of realized a bit of your calling, it sounds like. And I did want to ask, um, was just your family and all of your siblings are involved in ministry, preaching, teaching, writing, singer, songwriter, like a slightly different paths for everyone. I just wanted to ask, like, what was your, what led you kind of to your, you know, unique to calling? To coaching and ministry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. To all the coaching and retreats and <laughs> podcasting. And Hoping in Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am I would say that what I just described in my late twenties is what happened again in uh the, you know the last five years. I just I retired from the corporate workforce force. I was in institutional money management in my twenties. Um, my husband and I got married um the year I turned thirty and he worked for a music artist and he got to travel a lot and it didn't fail. When he was home, I'd be at work. When I was at work, he, you know, he was at home and he had this trip coming up to go to Japan. And I was like, am I really not going to go to Japan with my husband? Because I have to work like this is, I'm missing the best stuff here. And so we decided then that we could function on his salary. So I gave my notice and we just said, it's the first year of our marriage. Like I really want to enjoy that. But I went from that workforce to being a stay at home mom. And because we were a blended family, the day we got married, we gave each other the gift of two girls, one for him and one for me on that day. So as a stay-at-home mom, a year after that, we added uh, the first of the three boys that we have to the mix. Um, And then I had a child who was struggling, so I uh, started homeschooling her because, of course, I could do a better job than the teachers, right? So (laughs) I um, you know, started doing that. So then I spent – my 20s was corporate. My 30s was homemaking. But during those later homemaking years with college and kindergarten happening in my house, uh, my dad called and he said, listen, I've got this project. And I, I'm sure I had been talking about money or not have enough money. He said, I have this project. I, I need somebody to go through the transcripts of my sermons to 
um, put together a sermon illustration book. And I said, and I started asking him questions. And he said, oh, I don't know. I, I don't know. You'll have to talk to the publisher. I don't, you know, that's where <laughs> he's like, Tony Evans, that's how I get off. I create the content. Y'all figure out what to do with it. <laughs> and so um, I had a call with the publisher and they said, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of a grunt work job. We just need somebody to go through all of the transcripts and pull all of the sermons together. So I I initially um, thought, you know, I don't know if I have time to do this. And I thought, I can do this in the cracks and crevices. You know, I don't even have to listen to the sermons. I just need to scan the transcripts. Well, I've been listening to them for 40 years. So by scanning the transcripts, I know when an illustration is coming. I I know. So it was a very not hard job for me to do. I put it all into a Word document, handed it to the publishers, and they they told my dad, they were like, so has she ever done like work like this before? He said, no. And they said, she should, she should do this. She should write. She should edit. She should do something. Mm-hmm. Because what I gave them was apart from like layout, I had put links in the document so you could click on the topic and go. I mean, like I had made this embeddable document for I didn't I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do it. So that got me my second job, which when my dad wrote Kingdom Woman, he asked my mom if my mom wanted to do it with him. And she was like, no. So then he called me and he said, hey, do you want to do it? And I was like, no, I don't. I don't. I just finished the thing you just gave me. Like I have college and yeah. kindergarten happening in my house. I don't have time. He said, it'll be easy. Just tell stories. I was like, I really don't have time. Don't you have a blog? I said, I do, but it's like a mommy blog. He said, let me have my editor go check and see if we can use some of that. And then he calls me back. The editor said, you're 70% of the way there. So can you just write like, you know, 5,000 more words? I was like, I guess so. So I ended up in Kingdom Woman because he dragged me into that and I was not looking for it. Right. Mm -hmm. But here's what happened at the same time. Um, because of so many of the health challenges that my husband was having, was you know doing that illustration project and then wrote the book with my dad. And then after that, um, you can check the back of your website and see what people are searching to find you. And it was Crystal Evans single, Crystal Evans Hurst divorce, Crystal Hurst widow, Crystal Hurst. You know, like I was like, y'all are so nosy. But it made <laughs> me think. It made me think. What did I not say in Kingdom Woman that would be helpful? And then that's where she still there came from. So at the same time that I'm in unintentionally doing more to have a little bit of extra cash, a little bit of something that made me feel some value. When you put your name on books, people start asking you to speak. Priscilla's the speaker. I'm the reader, the nerd, the geeky girl. Okay. And so I started speaking because I was being asked, but not because I was trying to be a speaker. Well, at the same time that's happening, uh, my husband's health challenges caused him to be in a situation where he had to work less and less and less. And I talk about that in one of the books. He had a stroke. It was just a lot of different things went on. So I ended up in the speaking writing space because I was just answering the call to do the next right thing. But when I look back, I go, look at my hope at work. God knew that it was time for me to switch seasons again, but I was not looking for that. So he gave me an invitation and I can look back and see none of this was random. It was random at the time. You know, why are you asking me to do this or that? So when you ask me, how did I get here? Um, it's because the more I keep stepping into the next right thing, the doors kind of carve themselves out and unlock and open. I have a podcast because I was doing all this writing and I thought it takes me like, you know, an hour to write a solid 800 words. Like mm-hmm. if I talk though for 30 minutes, that'd be like 7,500. Then I could like cut up like six blog posts out of that. So it was me trying to keep up, you know, I'm I'm feeling like I'm failing and I can't keep up. And really that was the door to open a whole nother avenue. So I've been podcasting for 10 years before COVID happened in 2020. Somebody said, you ought to get on YouTube. And I was like, I don't want to do that with a podcast. You don't have to show your face. At least back then you didn't. Now everybody's video podcasting. Yeah. Um, But I was like, I don't want to have to get dressed. But I was like, I'm a geeky girl. I'll test out some equipment and maybe one day I'll do it. Well, I had tested it out when COVID hit. So the Monday of COVID, I said, let me just flip this switch on and practice and just go live. It'll be encouraging to people, you know, and then here we are five years later and I'm still doing that. So everything I've done has been in a response. So me encouraging and even coaching is because I get the same question over and over again. I'm like, you know what? Let me just do like a group coaching thing about that since it seems to be a pain point. But as I look at all of that, I just look back and I'm like, Along the way, here's what God knew. That in my early 20s, I used to be a Franklin Covey planner girl. And I I wrote in the goal section. One of my goals was 
one day, and I forgot about this and I found it cleaning out a box. One day, I would love to be able to write and to speak to teach women how they can practically apply God's word to their life. I didn't want to be a Bible study teacher. Mm-hmm. Like there's a, there's a lot of those and I love the Bible. Right. I I wanted to say, okay, because the Bible says this, let's talk about what it looks like to mother your children in this season. Let's talk about what it looks like to manage your finances and prepare for your, for legacy. Let's talk about, and, and I wanted to t- have those conversations 30 years later. What do I do? <laughs> there you are. And there would have been no way for me to create that or put that together on my own. Mm -hmm. My hope said in the season of your life when you're not planning it and when you don't even know that you need it. My thought was I'd write a book when I was 60 because by then my kids would be grown and I would know who I could use safely for illustrations and who to leave out. But my hope knew. So now my life and I, I, I forget I get independent and start muscling my way through it. I'm a typical firstborn, responsible achiever. Where are the bonus points? You know, that's right. (laughs) But I have to remind myself, you didn't get here because you muscled your way through it. You got here because you needed hope. You were broke. (laughs) You had a husband who was ill. You had a dream deferred. You were homeschooling kids and writing things at two o'clock in the morning. And God said, there's other things in you that you don't even see. It's like back to Adam and even the garden. There are all these trees for you to enjoy. And we kind of hyper-focus on the one thing we can't have or the one thing that's not working. When he's like, if you would just lean into me, I actually am at work creating things you would never even know to expect. So I think like children, we have to learn over and over again to turn towards him and put our hope in him. Amen. That's part of the sweet, sweet things of getting older that we can look back and see those connections and see how that played out and rejoice in him and then be able to mentor and encourage other people like keep looking, keep leaning, because one day you're going to find your hope story back when you wrote it in your Franklin Covey uh, thing and see you've done it. (laughs) He did it. How would you say people can know what that next right thing is? Because you know, I, I say, do you do you feel it in your gut? Do you, you know, is there a billboard that says, Haley, walk this way? You know, how how do you know what the re- next right thing is? Sure. Um, well, I think we overcomplicate calling and purpose and right. I think God can uh, hit a target with a crooked stick, but he does like us to be in motion. And I look at all the people in the Bible who we celebrate and we learn from who were crooked sticks in the hand of a master, uh, you know, a master shoot basically. And so the key is, is that we're seeking him. I mean, the Psalms is full of David, uh, angry, sad, upset, afraid, celebrative. He just kept talking and walking. He just kept seeking after God's heart. You seek first the kingdom of God. All the things will be added. We have to believe that. But what it practically looks like for me, um, a couple of ways I'd like to answer that. One of the things I talk about in my book, She's Still There, is this principle of gaining a new perspective on you, on who you really are and what you're supposed to do in this world. And the acronym is GAIN, for gain a new perspective, your gifts, your abilities, your interest, and your nature. So your gifts are the things that um, come naturally to you that don't necessarily come naturally for everybody else. It is uh, things that while anybody can learn them, you seem to have a knack for it. So some people have a knack for detail a knack for order, a knack for design, a knack for communicating, a knack for mechanically putting things together, a a, a knack for uh, decorating, a knack for color, a knack for gathering people in a room, a knack for leading. Um, You can even have um, the gifting of athletic ability. Like anybody can run, but it just seems to be easier for you. I feel like your gifts are a signpost. What did God already put in your hand? Exodus chapter three, when God is talking to Moses and Moses is like, are you sure you want me to do all that? God says, well, what do you have in your hand? Just throw it down. There are things we're already gifted with. Abilities are things that you have developed. You may develop your giftedness, but sometimes you can develop something that you didn't even want to do, but it doesn't mean that you don't now have the ability to do it. I may not naturally know how to play the piano, But if I go to lessons for 10 years, yes, I can play a Bach two-part invention because 
I have that ability. It's a skill. It's something that you can go to school for. It's something that you bring to the table that you had to learn and grow in. And interests are your passions. Man, I might not be gifted at it. I might not even be able to do it, but oh my goodness, I enjoy it. So you can enjoy music without having to be gifted as a singer or trained as a singer. You can be interested in painting. And so we go to painting with a twist, even though we're not gifted at painting. And we've never taken a painting class in our life, but we want to go have fun or we're interested in traveling or we're interested in learning about people. And so you look at that as where God is guiding your soul because you're wired to be interested in it. And then your nature is your personality. It's your hard wiring. It's what can get better as you age, but what is refined, it's not removed. Um, And so God works with our wiring. And we see this with the disciples, right? Peter was always the talker and the walker, always out front. God refined that. Paul was religious and um, he was so religious that he was willing to murder for it. Well, God refined that and said, you're very educated. I'm going to let you write a lot of these books of the New Testament. Um, But he was wired for education. You see what I'm saying? He And so um, God can use any of those things which are part of your heart, you're part of what's baked into you to guide you. So I don't think we have to overcomplicate it. It's like, what did God already put in your hand? What are you already gifted to do? What training do you have? What are you interested in? What gets you excited about it? What is your hardwiring? People have been telling you this ever since you were small. So that's one thing is I don't want to say look inside yourself in a a way that is in uh, disagreement with how scripture talks about. But I am saying that God wires us and we can see that when we look at the people in scripture that he chose, right? God chose a beautiful woman, Esther, to get the heart of the king who knew how to talk to and operate with a man so that when a needed decision was necessary, she knew how to navigate that conversation and wine and dine two men to get an outcome. Like that was an ability or was it a gift or was it, was it her interest in nature? We don't know, but it was baked in, right? So that's one thing. Don't overcomplicate it. Look at what God has put in your hand. The other thing is don't overcomplicate it. If God wants you to go through the door, like curtains, number one, two, and three, he will pull it back and reveal it to you. And so the key for us is just to pay attention. What is happening and getting stirred in you? Mm -hmm. And what do you see God already doing? And you may not have a reason, or maybe you do. Maybe it's your gifts, your abilities, your interests, or your nature. Maybe that's your reason. And you see God doing something and you're like, I kind of want to do that. That seems like something I wouldn't mind doing. God is so good because in my life, when I look at what he's already put in me, don't overcomplicate it. And when I look at the doors he's already opening, like March of 2020, when I flip a switch onto YouTube and then people say, what is it about this membership that you have? And I'm talking about that. And just to sidebar, people had said, you give us so much content. Can we support you? And I wasn't thinking start a ministry or whatever. So I created this little membership. Well, the membership in 2020 when everything shut down and I couldn't go speak was how we bought groceries. And because I flipped on the switch for YouTube, people said, oh yeah, we want to be a part of that and, su- and support what you're doing. Yeah. Well, I walked through an open door. COVID for me was an open door. Everybody was sitting at home. Hmm, I've got a camera. I've got this streaming software. I've been practicing. Let me walk through it. Let me flip on, you know, let me flip that. So um, I heard a pastor say once, Half of life is just not getting out of line. You know, we've all been to the grocery store and we think this line is going to be faster. So we're in this line and then we switch lines and we go over here and then this line is slower. And then we're like, oh, I shouldn't have got out of this line. He said, half a life is just you picked a line. And if you would just stay in the line, unless you're being disobedient, unless God calls you to do something different, because you're looking for the fastest thing or the open door or what everybody else is doing. And God is like, if you would just stay in the line, like, I'll put the stuff you need to check out with right when you get to that that belt, all the gum and all that. I will show you everything right. you need yeah. before you check out if you'll just stay put. So I'm convinced that if you would just be in motion and in communication with God and trust that he can meet your expectations. You can't even meet your own expectations. Mm-hmm. He can meet your expectations and that he will work with what he gave you, what's in your hand and what's in front of you the doors that open, that he, if you will just stay in line, will give you everything you need to check out. And you won't realize that until, you know, after you walk through the line, look at what's in your cart, see all the other people in lines and go, oh, I'm glad I stayed there. 
You know, right. half of the battle is just staying put and moving forward. I love that imagery. You know, as we talk so much about anxiety and people today being so stressed, and I think it's kind of like you said, we're trying to solve our own issues apart from just resting in what you're saying, what's in your hand and what's right in front of you. We, we, we're trying to jump lanes and, and figure it all out. And that is where we spiral out, you know, yes. because we we're trying to, I kind of joke, everything I told the Lord that I would not do oh, is yeah. what I've done. I mean, Correct. that is, it's my whole life story of me saying, here's my list and him saying some version of bless your heart, go sit still somewhere. You know, I feel like that's been my, my whole life. So even the, the idea of helping people understand your peace comes when you do finally just say, God, I believe you're good. And I believe that I can stay in this line. And I love, we're very practical at Hope for the Heart. We love like, okay, that's great. You're supposed to do that. You're supposed to lay it at the foot of the cross. You're supposed to trust Jesus. How? Yeah. What does that yeah. actually look like? And how does that play out as a single mom, as you know, whatever our circumstances are? So I I think that is so practical and so powerful just to give people that tool to realize you're already holding the lamp. Easy. Like you're already, you're already holding. holding the lamp. That is correct. Yeah. yeah. That is correct. Yeah. I think that, you know, again, time gives us perspective. And when we're willing to reach back and share our lessons learned with someone else, uh, we're sharing a lamp, right, that we've we've had. And then we say, here, you know, use this. But, right. I, you know, I think that um, there, you know, there are a lot of things that I'm concerned about or that I worry about or that I'm disappointed about or that I'm, you know, I, we look at our lives and we're like, how did we end up here? I didn't know this was going to turn out this way. This is helping me and has helped me greatly as I've learned it. We are not in control of our stories. We, we are not in control of our stories. We have someone who is writing our story. And it's like the choose your own adventure, you know what I'm saying? But those books back in the day, but even when you choose your own adventure, you're choosing what the author of the book gave you as a choice. Like he still right. knows, <laughs> like if you choose B, if you choose to go to page 47 and stay instead of page 33, he still knows how you're going to, you know, end up. It's like going through a maze. It's like somebody had to create the maze. There is a way out. Part of the journey is like choosing like a kid who trusts God or a kid who trusts a parent rather. You know, I have five grandchildren and the, and the fourth of those is a daredevil. Um, and she just jumps in the pool and we just better be there to catch her. But she doesn't jump in on the deep end where we're not. She jumps in, you know, wherever we're standing, three feet, five foot. She's jumping in the vicinity because she's like, I believe that if you're in the vicinity, You'll catch me or, you know, you won't be far, you know, to bring me up when I go under. But she is bold faced. I am going to jump in because my mother or my grandmother or my my father, they're in the water. I'm going to jump where they are and trust that I've got my floaties on. They prepared me that they're nearby. They'll raise me that they're not going to let anything bad. And she is having the time of her life because. She's not trusting in herself. If she did, she'd be going down to the other side of the pool when we're not looking. She only does it when we're there. And then daredevil, she jumps off the end and jumps in. I think we miss out on so much. I know I have missed out on a lot of amazingness in my life. A, because I wouldn't jump. B, because even when I knew that someone I trusted was in the water, I tried to control the narrative. Stand here. No, that's too far. I don't want to go under. Am I going to be okay? Are you looking? And I'm watching the joy that she's having just jumping in. I think Freedom. we could we could have so much less anxiety and stress, more peace, more joy, more happiness. And, you know, I'm not a spontaneous person. I'm a total type A rigid person. So I'm speaking to myself. <laughs> if I would just choose to say, listen, he's always in the water. And if I'm looking at him, looking for him, not just anywhere out here, okay, not all the trees, not that one, but the where he said I can go. If I'm looking for him, then sometimes you just jump. You just you just jump. Yeah. And say, I trust that if I'm in the vicinity, I'm praying, I'm reading my Bible, I'm going to church, I'm I'm I've got all these messages coming to me. 
What if my hope is built on taking chances? What if, what if my hope is built on, I've never done this before, but what if God meets me here? I mean, Moses was taking chances, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. So for me, I am currently learning that I would be much less disappointed in my life if I didn't try to craft all of the outcomes and control the narrative that much of what God wants to do in my life involves me seeing that he's in the vicinity, trusting that he's given me everything I need to stay afloat and just jump, just try it. Just pick up a conversation with this friend and who knew that this was going to be a 30 year friendship or, you know, try out this class and who knew this was going to be a hobby or maybe something that was a side hustle or try this church and go to this event. And who knew I was going to meet my husband there or, you know, I mean, so much of what God wants to do in our life is surprising us with the unexpected because we were never supposed to be trusting in what we could control or expect. We were supposed to be trusting in him. It's good. There's a lot I want to respond to there, but <laughs> um, it reminds me, we've had some conversations on this podcast about, you know, fear and how it often holds us back from doing what God has called us to do. So what you just shared was just an encouraging reminder to, you know, to jump in and step out and, then also just purpose in life. We've talked through that of how we, can't, we we think it's this big grand thing and it can be, but it's often what it boils down to is just doing the thing that's in front of you and, and using, you know, using what's in your hand, what's in the opportunities you have right in front of you. And so um, one last thing I wanted to ask you about was just kind of thinking on your story. It seems like, as we talked about kind of now in hindsight, you see how God has put mm-hmm. all these puzzle pieces together and things like that. And you can kind of see how he's used everything. Um, even though you, you might not have recognized it at the time, just, just wanted to ask, like, where do you feel like you're at now in your season of life? Like, what are you focusing on and looking forward to and, and things like that? Well, I will tell you that sometimes we learn a lesson and we have to learn a lesson again. So I am at the next level, the graduate degree level of learning the same lesson. I mean, they say you learn... You learn U.S. history if you're in a good school system. You'll have it three times before you graduate from high school. Then you got to go to college and do it again. You know, Mm -hmm. when you're in the U.S., you got to do that. So I feel like it's the same lesson, but the the next level, a deeper level of trust. And currently, what I'm doing is saying, "No, Lord, I want to be a good steward, but where am I? What am I calling stewardship that you're calling striving? That because." You, I hoped in you and you maybe even put something in my hand, but then I forget you put it in my hand and I start trying to figure out what to do with it. Like all in the name of, but I want to be a good steward. You know, it's like the proverbial situation of somebody serving Christ, but not spending time with Christ, but you're doing all these things for him. So Mm -hmm. where I am right now is slowing down, intentionally slowing down. To not assume that I know what the next right thing is, but to ask, to bring things that are working to the altar. And just because it's the good son doesn't mean you don't want me to take a knife to it. It it looks like me operating in a submissive, I don't have the answer even if I think I do. It is the discipline of bringing it to him and asking, what would you have me to do with this? Open, close the door, give me peace, don't give me peace. Repeat the message, Lord, if you need me to hear it again through a podcast or another sermon or a book or something on Instagram, my goodness, when I'm doom scrolling, like, Lord, you can have it. It is regularly bringing back to him the thing he gave me and saying, am I stewarding it or am I striving over it? Tell me the difference. And if I'm striving and not stewarding it well, you can have it. I, I'm in the season of my life where I don't want him to have to pry things from my hands for me to realize that I was holding them too tightly. I want to consistently bring them to him and ask, am I even supposed to still be holding this? And if he says no, to trust him because he was my hope, not the thing I had in my hand. So that's, I think, so many times that we think success with God is always going to equal a victory. That our story, like when we do the next right thing and when we step into trusting God and believing that he's good, that that means there's going to be some victory. But sometimes it doesn't lead to the victory. Sometimes it does lead to the disappointment or the thing we were hoping to avoid. 
And that's why I think what you're sharing about trusting him with the picture, like come what may, you know, come what may with our story. Our goal isn't to have success in this moment. Our goal is to fulfill our purpose and trust God. So whether or not, you know, I have the best singing voice and somebody's going to ask me to do whatever it is that I would like to do and not be disappointed. And I don't actually want to become, I mean, I can, I sing alto. If I've got the hymnal, I can sing the alto line, but it's, it's both in the victories and the disappointments that we really come to learn God's character and his goodness and how he tends to us in those disappointments. So just thank you for sharing such practical. I mean, that's so encouraging to us, but we can listen to your story today and immediately Im- apply gifts, abilities, interests in nature. And what was the name of the book where you developed that concept more thoroughly? Um, she's still there. She's still there. I just wanted to make sure that we had that included and encourage people to get that. So Dustin, where are we? And we want to wrap into telling people how they can hear more from Crystal and where they can find her. Yeah, well, thank you again for joining us today. It's been deeply encouraging to me, especially as father of three young girls, and I'm in that place of life where I have that one puzzle piece and I'm seeing how everything (laughs) fits together. So you've encouraged me and I know everyone will be listening as well. So you can find uh, Crystal on the Sister Circle podcast uh, and watch her on YouTube. Uh, and all uh, available podcast platforms. She has a number of books as well as uh, the coaching cohort of the Inner Circle. Find all all things Crystal at crystalevanshurst.com. And she'll be uh, speaking at our Hope Together conference this fall. So Mm -hmm. thank you for joining us for that and looking forward to meeting you in person there. Um, And one thing we want to do at the end of every episode, and especially for our guest, is pray for you. So um, before we close, Haley, would you mind bringing us out? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Lord, we just thank you for the reality of you, for the reality of your presence, for the, the truth, God, that you created us with a purpose. And we thank you, Lord, for the history of showing Crystal the next right thing and for her courage to step into that and for how you have used that in her ministry and her coaching and her teaching and her mentoring others just to sit still for a minute with people and help them consider where you are and where you are leading, God, and taking the pressure off of striving and beginning to just set still confidently in stewarding, God, what you have given us. So for those that are listening today, Lord, whether they're in their car or at home or the moment that they've set aside to listen to this podcast, God, I pray that your spirit would connect into their inner being. What are their gifts and abilities and interests? You are personal, God. It's not for us to strive and figure it out. You will tenderly show us that next step. So Lord, we pray that for all listening. We pray for you to just expand the reach of Crystal's practical message of putting their hope in you, that you, that more people would be drawn to her podcast and to her books, God, that you would give her a deep rest, that you would be bring healing to her husband, to her family, that generations to come through her husband and her and their stewardship and their courage to step in your ministry, God, we pray that you would expand that and that they would just overflow into life after life for years and years to come. God, we thank you for your goodness and for your grace and for your personal relationships with each of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Yes, we said you. that a hundred times, but just we know you are busy with all the things you have going on. So taking this time with us today is just an honor. So thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you again for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe to Hope Talks and follow along each week. We'd also love for you to leave a rating and review. This will help others more easily find the podcast. Thanks for your support and tune in next week.